I am curious to see if you are actually going to stay there. Hi, I'm Lars and this is my land. In my land, I get to do pretty much whatever I want. And today I'm going to talk about the ever elusive slippery creature that is the fifth beetle. And you're going to listen because it's my land. You might be thinking, Lars, I don't remember the Fab Five or the Five Headed Monster, but there are lots of people that have been given the name of the Fifth Beetle. So many people have been given this title that this is a badge of honor that doesn't really exist anyway, outside the fact that there are only four beetles. There are plenty of people that helped the beetles get to where they are. There are those early players who supported them and helped them build their brand and who they are, booked their work, helped perfect their sound, loved their gear, bought their anvils there are so many people that helped boost this group to become what it was it's impossible to know what the beatles would have been without these people sometimes i think we're getting a little too butterfly effect on this stuff there is not a fifth beetle i did some research on this topic i don't really know if people think that there's an answer to this or not but more importantly i don't care but if there was who would it be Oh, don't worry. I'm going to tell you. And I mean, for real, I'm going to tell you what I actually think. I'm not going to like just fence it. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Welcome to Annoying Memos Land. Beep, 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 beep. If you're new here, I talk mostly about the Beatles, but I'm also interested in TV and movies. And I wanted to let you know that I am going to be adding in some new stuff starting next week, but it's, it's music. It's just that your boy needs a little bit more time for some of these Beatle videos coming up and I can't just keep turning them out once a week. It's not feasible. And you guys, I think y'all deserve the very best of what I'm gonna give you. So there's gonna be some new stuff and I really hope you support me because I'm excited about it. But I haven't gotten into the TV and movies aspect of this at all because I've been working on a video essay on the TV show Lost for so long now that if I don't mention it in every video I do, I will be prank invited to prom and egged on my front porch. I can't be Josie Grossy, not again. Not again. I would absolutely love it if y'all would like and subscribe and all of that jazz. It helps me out a whole lot and it's free, baby. It is free. Follow me on Twitter at This Is Lars Land and any other place. If you can't find me, then I'm not there. <laughs> Let's go back to my land. So in one interview, Paul said that if there were to be a fifth Beatle, it would be Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, and George Martin, which is the Beatles producer. George Harrison said that if there were to be a fifth Beatle, it would be Derek Taylor, which was the Beatles press officer, and Neil Aspinall, which was like the Beatles business manager. Like he's 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 neil i don't know how to describe his um position those are what actual beetles have said that but both of them also said that there is no fifth beetle it's just the four of them there was no secret component or extra person that made them exactly what they were i think everyone can know that right and while george did mention Derek taylor as one of the fifth beetles i um I personally don't see that, so I didn't make a section on him. Maybe later. I want to say this. I'm going to I'm gonna let y'all burn me. I don't care if it was Brian Epstein or anyone else. I don't care if it was George Martin or anyone else. The Beatles and who they were would have made it the way that they did because it was them. They're, that sort of mania doesn't have to... I, I don't care if it was Brian Epstein managing them or George Martin producing for them. I believe that the Beatles would have made incredible music and an impact on the world without them, okay? And a lot of people will say that Beatles wouldn't be what they, like, I'm, I just, I can't say that. I can't say that. There were so many other opportunities that the Beatles could have had that were bigger and different and more lucrative and they became what they were with these deals. So it's kind of like, you know, Brian has had lots of praise, but also some criticisms. It's like, a, I'm going off on a tangent right now, but I just can't say that there is one particular person or all of these particular things that created this thing. The Beatles were very different from any other band, but it's just obvious to me. And it's obvious to the world. What I think is going to be really fun about this, I have like a problem, a particular issue, an obsession with the Get Back documentary, the Nagger tapes, that entire, the Let It Be, all of it. So <laughs> fun for me is that the fifth Beatle topic and a lot of the people that come up in this video are talked about in get back i mean i just like him in our band actually yeah. i like a fifth beatles and i get to show my get back obsession for this video i'm excited and it's also good because get back was in january 1969 right so that is like at the end of the beatles now there was a lot of tension that's kind of part of the 
it colored the documentary. But if it is going to be your last TV show, you're running TV yeah, show. You're only surmising, Robbie. Just because we no, got a bit grumpy. If, no, I am. We've been getting that, grumpy but, for the last 18 months. But I think that it's good to see where the conversations were, how the mindset was at the end of the Beatles. I also think it's important to mention that people's opinions, thought processes, and truths or whatever change over time. Our boys have said lots of things. Some of them meant it. Some of them meant it to hurt each other. And some of them have really changed their tune on a lot of things over the course of years. We can get really uh, picky about who said what, about who deserves credit here and there. And the reason why I'm putting up this disclaimer is that these are all very important people to the Beatles. I will be doing the different video because there's so much here. In no way am I trying to discount or like remove or invalidate their purpose with the Beatles, right? If we are starting, well, at the very beginning, then we need to start with before the Beatles. The lineup actually changed a whole lot in the early Beatles history with George George, John, and Paul being very steady members, but also people like Stuart Sutcliffe and well, a bunch of other people. Just wanted to add a few things. Stuart Sutcliffe was very important. He was an art student with John to whom he became so attached that he pulled into the band. Stuart did not play any instruments, but he was drafted to play bass. He was so bad that during live shows, he would face the amps <laughs> because he didn't want people to know that he couldn't really play. But he did play for a while until he eventually was like, John, I just... I'm not into it. When they went over to Germany, he met Astrid Kircher. Well, they all met Astrid Kircher and Klaus Forman. They were dating at the time and they became really good friends and eventually fell in love. Then Stuart died in a very untimely death and why don't I have the date in here? He died when he was 21 on April 10th, 1962 and his death was caused by an aneurysm. Stuart really does need his own video and I make a lot of jokes about this throughout the video, but he was very important to John, but let's be realistic. He had no bearing on the Beatles music and definitely doesn't belong in this list, right? Sorry. I've talked about the lineup in the fascinating history of the Beatles drumming video. So if you want to learn more about that, I have that. But even in that video, there are like a few tour drummers that I neglected to mention. There's a lot of them, but for two years of the Beatles existence, the drummer was Pete Best. They knew each other through mutual friends, but also because a local gig place, the Caspa, was run by Mona Best, Pete's mom. There's a lot there including Neil Aspinall. <laughs> We're not gonna get into baby daddy situations, but there's a lot there. Mona Best was like kind of like a den mother. The Beatles spent a lot of time like playing at the Casbah. At this point, they are really needing a drummer. They find out Pete has a drum kit and they're like, hey, do you wanna go to Germany with us? And he could keep a beat well enough and so he went. He wasn't a particularly good drummer, but he was a drummer. I've gone into this specifically in other videos and I've said it every single time, the dude couldn't hang. Turns out that Pete, he just, wasn't the party type. He coughed too loud in the smoke circle. He passed out with his shoes on. Dude could not hang. And that's not even to mention the fact that he sucked at drums. And I have to say, I've gotten nothing but well, all but one incredibly nice comments about Pete Best. Like people have met him. They have said he's so sweet. He had a really hard time after the Beatles kicked him out. Ultimately, it just didn't work out. So Brian was tasked with firing him and Ringo was brought in. There were a couple of names floated, by the way. And in fact, there was a session drummer that came in for one and a half sessions. One of them, he like didn't do anything. But people will be like, two sessions. And I'm like, maybe, maybe two, maybe two. Get off Ringo's back. <laughs> then Ringo became the Beatle. Pete Best has a following in Liverpool and in the UK, but that is a different video. Actually, before Brian was the Beatles manager, Pete was the Beatles manager. He was the one with most access to the telephone and nobody wanted John taking the calls. <laughs> this is a true fact, according to Pete Shotton, John Lennon's childhood best friend. That boy is not to be trusted with the public, obviously. There's a lot of information information on Brian and he needs his own videos. But I'm gonna keep this as brief as I can. So nitpick in the comments, I do not care. This is what I said. I'm literally writing this at 11.08 p.m. on a Wednesday and it is not the time, Ruben. Sorry, Rubens. It was truly the third name I came up with. The first one was George and I was like, well, that's not gonna work. I got a George on this list. The next one I came up with was the name of my brother's childhood best friend and a main character on the TV show Scrubs and also the name of a music YouTuber. So I was like, maybe let's go with Ruben. Incidentally, this is a person perfect time considering that I've got more visitors here in my land than ever that I talk about my rule. Now what's a rule research Lars? I don't consume content on the topics I cover. 
And why is that? I don't want to compare my work to someone else's and I like learning this stuff myself, but early in my Beatlemania, I took some information at face value and it painted my opinion of three major players in the Beatles universe for a few months. And if I had made a video about those things during that time, that could have been really detrimental and that scared me. I take that seriously. And finally, most importantly, there is so, there's so much Beatles stuff, guys. I need, I need to have free time. Like if I was trying to catch up with all, I, I, I need to have free time, okay? I've seen Drew Gooden's video on Lost, Simon Whistler's videos on George and John, and I've seen a bunch of Todd in the Shadows, One Hit Wonders. So let's go back to Brian. <laughs> Brian managed his family's record store, NEMS, and because Brian is very good at sales and merchandising, he was keeping a finger on the pulse of the local music scene, obviously. He's reading Mercy Beat. Brian's paying attention to it. At this point, there's like a bunch of Liverpool bands that are going over to Hamburg for these residencies, and people are paying attention to the Beatles. There's this buzz about the Beatles and he was interested. So he finds the Beatles in the cavern, which is a different video. He was so taken by their sound and their stage presence that he signs them for a five-year contract as soon as he can, which was January 24th, 1962. The Beatles had an immediate and intense connection to Brian Epstein. In all sincerity, they attempted a seance after he died. So the next few years, Brian works tirelessly to promote the Beatles, get their tours moving, get their name out there. He created their image, made them these like four boys that looked alike. Now the fashion stuff, all of the matching stuff, that was also Paul that started before. Brian really polished this. He wanted them to look very professional. The Beatle bow. <laughs> That was Brian. The image of the Beatles and how all of their affairs were was meticulously manicured by Brian. So when Brian passed away in 1967, the Beatles found themselves entirely unmoored. It was difficult for them. Ever since Mr. Epstein passed away, it's never been the same. I mean, we've been very negative since Mr. Epstein passed away. And that's why all of us in turn has been sick of the group. They felt that they had become lost without him. And there's so much more that I cannot get into here. I'm so sorry, different video. I'm sincerely sorry. Brian's job was the unit of them and, and I can't help but think that when they lost him they lost like the rubber band that kept the pencils together and I know that that's a stupid metaphor but it was the one that came to mind when I wrote this. Future Lars here the metaphors only get dumber buckle up and that is true they get fucking weird. I'm gonna be completely honest here my Brian knowledge is sorely lacking so I'll say that all of the Beatles have said that they would not be where they were in this world without him and you can just expect more information on him in the future. Now, speaking of Brian, when he was trying to get the Beatles signed, he approached George Martin and he was the producer at Parlophone. That's a long story, different videos. So much of the Beatles sound is owed to him. And if there is a fifth Beatle to me, it's him. He would be the one I would give the title to. I'm gonna read directly here. Okay, Script Lars is feeling very conflicted because I want to give Brian due credit for his work with the Beatles image, but I still feel that the Beatles would have worked out their own image with Paul matching fashion, etc. The Beatles were so eager to learn about music that George Martin was the right man for the job. George Martin didn't meet the Beatles particularly early on in their musical careers. They'd all been playing music for years at this point. However, they were still novices to a lot of chords, a lot of melodies, exactly how to make these things go together. Maybe what makes a song more cohesive. They didn't understand the purpose of a hook before they met George and George was able to sort of give them not necessarily like that formal training, but saying, here's these bits and pieces. The way that George has actually described it is that he said that he finds the genius, he puts, gives it a frame. I'm a shaper of people's talents, really. I put the frame around there they're genius. You know, that's what it is. All I do is add the trimmings and wrap it up so that people can take it. Once George was involved with the Beatles, they put out chart topping hits immediately and subsequent albums back to back. We're talking Please Please Me at the top of the charts, 30 weeks just to be replaced from the top of the charts by With the Beatles. That is his work. He helped them with all their harmonies. He wrote so many of their accompaniments. The first song that didn't have the accompaniment 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 by him was she's leaving home and that was like a sore spot that's probably a different video he plays on so many of their instruments in their songs he does the piano solo on a day in life he is everywhere he, he can be felt everywhere in the beatles music his son helps remaster their newest stuff that's coming out and some of their newest stuff george martin knew the boys in and out some people have also mentioned jeff emmerich as an honorable mention jeff emmerich was an audio engineer for 
for the Beatles. He was wildly inventive in the studio and was known for being able to achieve whatever bizarre thing that Paul or John cooked up that day. Now here's the stupid metaphor. While George was framing the genius person, Jeff was definitely the one supplying the paint. Wait, no, the paint would be the Beatles. That would be the music, right? And then George, Martin, I know, too many Georges, is the one creating the frame, like finding the place, maybe even the backdrop of the painting, right? So that's that. And Brian would be the one who chose the information about the painting on the placard, the museum in which the painting was displayed, the public persona. Oh, I know what Jeff was. Jeff made sure the color was right. John and Paul frequently came to George, Martin, and would say, we want something that's absolutely crazy with no context whatsoever. And George Martin would go, yeah, cool, no problem, we'll figure it out. And in many cases, that meant Jeff will figure it out. Not the best segue, but one of the fifth Beatle contenders is Jimmy Nickel, who is a drummer who substituted in for Ringo during the 1964 Australia tour. He did it from June, let me check the dates before I say it. He did eight shows from June 4th to 14th while Ringo was hospitalized with tonsillitis. There's a few things about him and Get Back. I think you'll Fine, we're not going abroad because uh, Ringo just said he doesn't want to go abroad. So, yeah. also Jimmy Nichols might go abroad. <laughs> he was actually mentioned twice in Get Back. And he was sitting up on this roster, he was just eyeing up all the women. He's just, yeah. <laughs> and we just, one, two! <laughs> and we went to <laughs> Next contender is Billy Preston, and he has a really special little place in my heart as I am a get back fiend, and he just made the place so much happier. Billy Preston is like a piano slash organ player who met the Beatles back in Hamburg. Because he plays all so great now. Ray Charles doesn't bother with the organ now. He just I'll leave it to the young guy. But during Get Back, the Beatles were deciding, okay, we're gonna play music that doesn't need any backing, stuff that we can perform live. They were so used to having these like more full songs with more experimenting and they needed a fifth Beatle. <laughs> Every number's got a piano bar and normally we overdub it, you know. But this time we want to do it live. And they needed a piano player. Luckily, Billy Preston was in the UK and he swung by. On scene, so if you'd like to do that, you'll sure. Beautiful. <laughs> Right, and then you'd be on the album. You're kidding. <laughs> and he got pleasantly roped into doing this project. So he shared a credit on Let It Be, and he also got signed with Apple, and I think had a few studio albums with them. So it worked out well. Billy Preston is beloved by everyone. He went on to work with other Beatles and George in particular later on in life. So Billy Preston was definitely a great force, but certainly not a fifth Beatle. Okay, so here's like the main fifth Beatle thing and get back that I want to talk about. I mean, I just like him in our band, actually. Yeah. I like a fifth Beatle. We can do that as well. You know, I asked Dylan to join the Beatles. Yeah. And he would as well, you know, and we get, get them all in it. We call it the Beatles and Cove. That'll be our band. John and George do say that they want to add Billy to the band. They go on to talk about adding more people like Dylan, Clapton, Elton John, etc. This doesn't mean in any way, shape, or form that they were actually seriously considering adding a fifth member. It mostly sounds like having a collaborative band was something that the boys were interested in. It's something that both George and Ringo went on to do with the Traveling Wilburys and the All-Star Band, respectively. I don't put too much weight here. Here's where I put the weight. I just don't because it's just bad enough for four. I think he meant what he said, that he was overwhelmed with having four Beatles right now. But I think he really took that moment seriously because throughout Get Back, okay, I can't get into this. I have so many things to say about Get Back. I think he took that seriously though. If Paul were able to keep the Beatles together at this point, there was no way he was gonna let anything else breach that group. <laughs> No way. Now we need to talk about some honorable mentions, I guess is where I would put them. There are so many people that I'm not even remotely touching on right now. There's like a point where it seriously does get to butterfly effect. Like if they didn't meet so-and-so, then they wouldn't meet so-and-so and it gets so much. Here's some people that are just listed here. Chaz Newby, press officer Derek Taylor, guitar slash musician Tony Sheridan, drummer Andy White, Eric Clapton, Klaus Foreman, DJ Murray the K, and a few others I do not care about. The Beatles kept their circle very small. They only like hired from within. Even with people that were wildly 
wildly unqualified for the positions that they were being hired for different video they only trusted a few people and they had reasons to not trust people so a couple of the people that are very important are Neil Aspinall and Mal Evans. Neil Aspinall started out as a school friend of Paul and George's, but he became basically their right hand man. He started out as their road manager and then eventually just became their like assistant, like executive assistant. And he just oversaw everything. He was one of the people that made sure the wheels kept moving. When Olivia Arias accepted George's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction or whatever, she said that Neil Aspinall was the one, that he was the one to thank. And it's the person in this room that George knew the longest in his life. And someone who looked after him and all of them from the time they were 13 to, for George, the end of his life. And that's the mysterious Neil Aspinall. Neil drove them from gig to gig. He made sure that the boys got places. And many times I'm pretty sure that he kept them in line. There's like a photo, one of the photos of a fan assaulting Paul and Neil is just behind him just like, oh good God, I lost Paul. I'll be honest, I know very little about Neil except for that he was just so incredibly important to them. Mal Evans, um, I actually don't. He was the road manager and personal assistant of the Beatles. He worked with them from 1963 to 70. So Mal worked part-time as a bouncer at the Cavern, which is a different video, right? You know, and that's how he met the Beatles. And then Brian hired him on as like a roadie. And then over time, it says, this is Wikipedia. Over time, Evans became a constant companion to the group being present on all of their tours. And after the Beatles stopped touring in 1966 at nearly all of their recording sessions. And that is true. Mal does everything. Mal, we should get a hammer. And an anvil. See you later. Okay, Mal is awesome. He is our clang clang Maxwell silver hammer came down upon her head. He is the clang clang. He has the most heartbreaking story ever. Oh, that's a video I have seen. There's a video about Mal Evans' tragic life. It is heartbreaking. I'll just look it up right now. Jeff Witcher's Final Destination and it is episode 589. This guy's done 589 busy okay anyway the video is the life and tragic death of beatles roadie mal evans and it was a very good video and someday i will also do a video on it but in the meantime i highly suggest you go watch i mean it will break your heart i'll have it linked below with all my sources and stuff i have to say the beatles videos that i've seen are totally good and that's why i i mentioned them but mal sincerely was like everything he did everything for the Beatles. No matter what was going on with the Beatles world, he was going to be needed there. There's a lot of time to get back when he's bringing them tea, but he's also going out and getting George a tie or finding someone to get it. Mal, can you get, send somebody to buy me a, you know those lace bow ties? You can call them a damn, a black one. A cowboy one. Yeah, yeah, but they get them, they just clip on yeah. under. Yeah, it's it's yeah. He's writing John's lyrics. He is helping write lyrics with Paul. He also contributed lyrics to songs. He co-wrote a song on Ringo's album. If you want to learn more about that, you can watch my video on the Ringo album. It's a good video. It's solid. I do Ringo justice here. For real, Mal did everything. There's a famous, famous, famous story. The Beatles were driving on a tour. Mal was driving them and something hit and broke the glass on the windshield. And it was snowing so badly that Mal couldn't see and he had to punch out the windshield so he could drive. So he is driving like this and the boys are in the back on top of each other rotating and whoever is at the top is the coldest and then they would just switch and go back to the bottom and they called it a beetle sandwich that's a story that paul tells all the time it's very cute that our guys are doing a beetle sandwich but you got to think about the man who's getting paid like minimum wage driving through the cold putting his literal life at risk because he loves these boys and he was like their most trusted guy. There are so many other stories. One time they were trying to, I don't remember exactly what the song was, but John wanted something. He wanted to record something that sounded underwater. So Jeff Emmerich went to Mal and said, do you have something that would let me submerge something underwater? And Mal was like, and he said that Mal has like a bag that was just similar to Mary Poppins and he would just be able to bust shit out of it. And he thought about it for a second and he was like, I know, condom. <laughs> 
they put the thing in the condom. The first half of this video was heavily scripted and the rest of it is not. It's my favorite way to do things. <laughs> it's always a mess. Mal was there for like all of it, okay? The night that John decided to leave the Beatles, Mal drove Paul home that night and Mal was taking Paul everywhere pretty much at this point and they both cried, not together. They stayed in different rooms and cried all night. These guys were family and Mal was incredibly important to the Beatles. Now, before this next name, I want to remind everybody that this is a list of everybody that's been called the fifth Beatle, even in jest. And one person that was called that was Yoko Ono, okay? Yeah, Yoko Ono, shut up, it's not my fault, okay? I do not think that Yoko in any way, shape, or form is any sort of Beatle. I don't think that she has any real tangible bearing on any of the Beatles' music or whatever. And the rest of it is a different video different videos. God. There are a lot of people who helped the Beatles become the Beatles and a lot of people who supported them long after. But it's pretty obvious that the Fab Four are just that. Four. John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Thank y'all so much for visiting my land. I would absolutely love it if y'all would like and subscribe and all of that jazz. It is free and it helps me out so much. I love y'all so much and y'all come back now, you hear? Bye! My sweet Lord. Mm, my Lord. Mm. Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord, my sweet Lord.